Okay, thank you firstly to Kirsten and Anthony, whose study was obviously very interesting and uh, there is a, a considerable link between uh, what they have just presented to us this afternoon and a study which I was involved in earlier this year. So I firstly propose to give a very brief summary of the study I was involved in, uh, respond to a number of questions which overlapped with what we've also just heard about, and then situate what I've done in relation to um, the author's report which we heard about this afternoon. So the, uh, a very, very brief summary of mine, first of all, um, on the subject of teaching with translation. The official title was Reviving the Popularity of the Study of MFL in England, Using Translation as a Strategy for Teaching and Assessing French in Secondary Schools. It was inspired, actually, by a couple of facts. Obviously, recently there has been a considerable, a considerable decrease in the uptake of MFL in uh, secondary schools in England. This has been attributed to the Labour government's decision in 2004 to make um, MFL non-compulsory and also to the very challenging nature of the study of MFL as a discipline. Uh, students have been reported to choose subjects which are apparently easier. Uh, this has clearly uh, an impact or an effect on the further education sector, the higher education sector, and as we heard about from colleagues earlier, this is particularly uh, concerning for uh, the, the international job market. So the key questions, well, a number of the key questions were if and how translation is currently employed as a strategy for teaching and assessing language, and whether use of translation could indeed revive the popularity of the study of MFL in England. Uh, first of all, at the study which I was involved in was on a much smaller scale than that which we've heard about this afternoon. Uh, it was focused on one city in England and in the secondary sector. Uh, and was based on three questionnaires. So for GCSE level, that's the public examination taken at the age of 16, AS taken at the age of 17, and A2 at the age of 18. Um, the questionnaires were structured, were devised with um, a senior teacher of modern foreign languages, and the preliminary answers were, yes, translation can be used to many ends. Some staff are still in, extremely enthusiastic about uh, using it to teach grammar, interestingly but grammatical and communicative approaches are by no means mutually exclusive and consequently yes it would be a reasonable assumption that uh, translation could be used to help to revive the popularity of MFL. So the questions which overlap with those which we've heard about this afternoon. Um, can translation contribute to effective language learning at all levels? Uh, the respondents to this study said yes, indeed it can. As I mentioned before, it was considered uh, at three levels, GCSE, um, AS and A2. Uh, at GCSE level, staff responded that translation could really be used for vocabulary building act activities and also for reading comprehension, interestingly. But as translation is viewed as uh, an advanced language skill by most um, secondary teachers who responded, and a number of those said that the more able pupils display a greater interest in translation uh, as an activity, it would, I think, be fair to say within the context of this study that the more advanced the students are, the more translation can be used effectively as a language teaching strategy. <coughs> Uh, the second question which overlaps with today's um, uh, presentation uh, was, is it part of the language teaching curriculum and if not, is there a willingness to uh, introduce it? Well, in fact, it did seem to be part of all of the um, advanced level syllabi which uh, were used by the respondents. Um, and interestingly, those who responded said that even if it wasn't part of the curriculum, they would still be very interested to use it because they find that it's a particularly challenging and well-received activity, especially by advanced level students. I think that had it not been received as positively, that could have been due to a number of reasons. Maybe staff had had a negative experience of language, to, uh, grammar as a... Um, grammar, translation as a language teaching strategy when they themselves were students. Um, 
they may alternatively lack um, confidence in their own ability, in which case I fully endorse the recommendations made in today's report, um, which suggests that uh, LT teachers be given access to communicative and interactive uh, view of translation through publica publications, online materials and short training courses. Um, a lack of willingness to use translation may also be due to a stereotypical view that teachers have of translation as uniquely a method of teaching grammar. Again, I think the, the um, approach uh, suggested today whereby staff are given access to more materials and maybe an education of how uh, translation can be used alternatively would again be particularly helpful. And the third and last um, point of uh, overlap, how uh, can translation as a method of language learning be made more attractive to or motivate students? Well, interestingly, all those who responded already said that it is, is extremely attractive and uh, they were very motivated to use it and found the students also very motivated. Uh, they see translation as a challenging and rewarding activity. And I have a, a nice quote from uh, one of the respondents to my study, uh, if I may just read that quickly. Uh, the respondent in question mentioned a general realisation that language learning is not just buying ice creams. To create more complex sentences and paragraphs with sophisticated meanings, there is a requirement for precision and a deeper understanding of how grammar makes language fit together. So clearly some teachers still value and are enthusiastic about translation as a method of teaching grammar. Uh, they responded also that it could be used to many other ends for vocabulary, fluency, reading exercises and to improve communicative competence by using it as a stimulus to um, inspire discussion. I thought that was quite sophisticated for students at the age of 11, uh, uh, 18 but uh, apparently it is effectively used and it's also used to practice exam technique. So uh, I think the main message coming over in, in this uh, connection is that grammatical and communicative approaches are by no means mutually exclusive. So just to conclude, uh, there were clearly some major differences between the study which we heard about today and the one which I was involved in, um, mainly on the uh, level of the scale. Obviously today uh, we saw a number of countries had been considered, three sectors of education and there were hundreds of respondents. Uh, the study which I was involved in uh, was based in England in one sector of education and only had, well, a, uh, a handful of responses. Uh, also, uh, one of the differences was in terms of how grammar was viewed. Uh, in today's study, it would seem to be somewhat frowned upon and communicative methods uh, preferred. In this study, grammar was viewed very positively, but communicative approaches were also viewed favourably too. So uh, I think the, they could be certainly used in conjunction with one another. But the main point which came over, I think the main point of similarity between the two studies, was that if translation is um, presented as being a communicative activity and being focused on intercultural competence, then it's... Um, regarded uh, in an overwhelmingly favourable way. Okay. Okay, thank you very much.